Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Brave Healing Podcast. I'm Laura DeFranco, and it's my mission to build a revolution of healers who are sharing their words and messages out loud and changing the world one brave word at a time. Thank you so much for being here to listen in today. This is a really special episode, you guys, because I have three of the 25 amazing authors of the new book, The Ultimate Guide to Self-Healing Techniques, here to help me with my mission today. The Ultimate Guide to Self-Healing Techniques is a collection of 25 powerful holistic practices and tools you can use at home for peak health and wellness. You're gonna learn from 25 experts who are sharing their stories, passions, and transformational tools with you. Most tool books, you guys, the ones that I own anyway, they only focus on one thing, one modality or one tool. So it was my specific goal to create a very unique collaboration here instead. And when I introduce um, the three amazing women today, I think you guys are going to have an idea of just what kind of badassery is in this book. And um, listeners, if you're listening to the podcast in celebration of this new book, this episode is available in full video format inside a special group on Facebook for our Amazon purchasers. So if you're wanting to access all 25 authors, special interviews, Q&A, video trainings of the tools, all kinds of bonuses I can't even think of right now to list, um, please see our show notes with the details. That's a temporary launch bonus, and so you're going to want to jump on it as soon as you hear this. So now. Without further ado, help me, here to help me talk about Brave Healing, um, I have three outstanding women. Laura Mazada is an expert therapist and certified Akashic Records practitioner with over 16 years of experience. She's passionate about guiding therapists, coaches, and healers in the space of the Akashic Records to gain clarity and decisiveness in their lives and business. And um, for all of our authors today, you guys are going to find their websites in the show notes. So definitely hop over and find out more about them. Um, next, we have Karen Tasto. She helps women tune in and turn on to their feminine powers so they can live in their fullest expressions. She's a certified women's empowerment life coach, Reiki master, sacred circle facilitator, retreat leader, and author. Karen's also a recovering good girl like I am too. Tree hugger, dancer, and mom of three young adult boys. Find out more about her in the show notes on her website link. And lastly, we have Jerice Pappas. She's a certified professional coach and Enneagram specialist. Her transformational coaching approach and extensive knowledge of the Enneagram calls forth your inner wisdom and personal power while you gain self-knowledge. She offers Enneagram typing sessions, one-to-one -one coaching sessions, facilitates Enneagram workshops, and is an inspirational speaker. And you're going to get the drift of that in any minute, you guys. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. What, Thank what's you happening having... this morning? You're welcome. I'm happy to have you. First of all, Thank you so much for being part of this project. I know um, from the very beginning, I felt a really, really big energy, and it's because of um, all you and your big energies, so thank you for that. This is um, an amazing project, and you guys um, are incredible. Uh, so I want everyone to kind of have an understanding about who you are and what this chapter was that you wrote about. So um, I'm gonna start with Jerice. Dries, tell us a little bit about why the Enneagram, and I know very small amounts about this, and I'm sure there are people who know a little and no, know nothing, so tell us everything. <laughs> well, in a nutshell here, I will say that as from a young person um, and then growing up in, in my 20s, I had things happen in my journey that um, really had me be in pain and wonder why about uh, life. Um, and as a result, something had me become this, this angst in a way, had me become a seeker, a seeker of transformation. And 
I did lots of different modalities when I was in my early 20s. I, my curiosity fortunately carried, carried me to keep exploring. And then I came upon the Enneagram, and I tell a little bit about that story in, in my chapter. And I will say that there has not been another system that I have discovered that has and shows a specific map helping us understand our true motivations and what drives us. And, but the most impactful piece is that when you do this, the Enneagram in a way became my greatest teacher because I was learning about myself. And when you bring compassion to that process, uh, healing happens. So I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> well, I, actually, I'm going to pick up on that last thing you said about compassion. I, I have also, I think everybody um, in this project and most healers in general are great dabblers and seekers. And they want, you know, part of being a healer, I think if we like listed the top 10 things, marks of a healer, um, one of those top 10 would be that practice of a beginner's mind and always wanting to learn new things and try new things and see what happens with this new thing and what kind of layer can I peel, you know, in my healing journey with, um, with this new technique. But the thing about compassion is really important, right? Why, why is that? Why do you think? Well, because- Self-compassion. <clears throat> because without, without self-love, um, there's, uh, for a real true healing, for sustainable healing to happen, we need to have our presence with us. And the other C that I'm going to throw in right along with the compassion is courage. And the courage is not about being brave. It is about being in your body with your presence, with your feeling, with whatever is arising. It could be the greatest joy. It could be the greatest grief. And when we are with ourselves in that 100% way, with that love, that's where the healing happens. And that's, that's what, through my studies with the Enneagram and working with people that I have learned, it's, a, it's almost like magic, but it's not. But there's a little bit like something like that happens with our presence, with the compassion and the courage that go hand in hand. Yeah, the courage to be in your body and feel your way through life versus just reacting to everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, Self-compassion is really, really important. And also, as I think maybe the, the second mark of a healer would be that we're all true. Uh, this is good or bad, but people pleasers and helpers, right? And we do a lot of that and we have all through our career. Um, but to give ourselves back some of that so that we can give from an overflow is so massively important. And that self-compassion, I think, is part of that. Um, so what else, anything else you want to tell the readers who are reading these chapters about your chapter in particular or um, something about the Enneagram in particular? Well, <clears throat> one thing I will say is that the, the whole Enneagram, which you might see behind me here, I have the symbol behind me, all of it lives inside of us. One particular point, it's like an archetype, is our own trajectory where we have, it's our growth, one growth path. And yet, as we do our work, it gives us access to all of it. And in this chapter, I focused on each type's core needs. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But for instance, type six, which I focus on in this chapter, which has is about the need to be sure, certain, or secure. So here we are in these times of coronavirus, having certainty um, and surety be ripped out from underneath us. I have found with the practice of um, these inquiries that I have included in the book and uh, with presence, we're able to find our own, inner, our own inner guidance to help us bring forth strength and a new kind of certainty that doesn't live out on the skinny branches of life. It kind of returns us to the inner trunk of our own tree. I love that. I like my inner trunk. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Dries. I'm going to move our, over to Laura now. And um, Laura, so uh, just you've been hearing some things about, you know, being a healer and you are one of those amazing people who help people in all kinds of different ways. And you chose to, or, I can't remember, I was telling another author this, I might have chose your topic for you or you chose your topic for you, could have gone in either direction. But tapping is honestly one of my favorite tools, not only because I can do it myself, but just because of the profound changes I felt when I got into that. So talk to us a little bit about your chapter and why tapping. Sure. So if tapping is also called EFT, emotional freedom technique, and it's an energy psychology technique that really allows us to use our mind and body to shift and release some of the negativity or stuck emotions that have been building for years or even days or even weeks. And at the same time, after you release, you have the opportunity to then internalize and um, integrate new belief systems and new feelings that you're now choosing to move forward on your path. And that's why I like it so much because first of all, by the time we get to the point where we think I need tapping, most of us have some kind of presentation in our physical body, whether it's discomfort, or we're feeling a lot of negative emotion that's interfering with our functioning. And so it's beautiful because this allows us to return to our bodies and create that foundation of safety within ourselves by saying, all right, I'm gonna tap out all of this stuff that I don't want that no longer serves me. And now I've opened up some energetic space within me to then put new belief systems in. And I love that it incorporates both because I think a lot of times, um, you know, we look at modalities and say, okay, this is a great time to bring this up and let's talk about it. And then what, where are we then integrating right away the new stuff, you know, the stuff you want to hold on to and have lasting change with. I will never forget my first experience with tapping was actually with a practitioner, meaning um, my first experience wasn't just trying it on my own. I accessed a healer that I had heard about like a recommendation and I didn't know what modalities she practiced. So I just showed up and I'm like, I want a session, you know, but um, I'll never forget uh, after my session with her, which was guided tapping, basically, and the guided piece of the dialogue, which was very powerful. And she, of course, was an extremely intuitive, amazing woman. Um, but I left that office feeling like a hundred pounds had lifted from my body. Yeah. That was the physical feeling I had. And I couldn't quite you know, uh, I was still processing as I was leaving that office and like trying to figure out what just happened from me sitting in a chair, tapping my face and talking with her. Right. And I just, I loved it. It was amazing. So I always tell people, if you're having trouble doing it on your own, please access somebody who can guide you for a time or two. Would, would you agree? And, or what would you say about that? No, so, so what I usually do is I will take my clients through tappings and, and we'll record them and then they can have access to them, which is good because it's personalized. Um, and I think that it depends on what you've gone through. A lot of my clients are able to kind of jump on YouTube and find a lot of free tappings for pretty much anything you can think of. Um, but the biggest complaint that I usually get is, uh, not the full thing didn't really resonate with me or I couldn't go deeper. So that's really the benefit that you get if you work with a practitioner, because I find that the real core beliefs and that deeper, deeper stuff that you want to release happens on round three. So it's like we tap through round one and then we kind of journal about that. And then we tap on the stuff we journaled and then we tap again. And by round three, you're really at that aha moment where it's like, oh, okay, this is what was underneath all of this. And it's just, you know, when you get to that deeper stuff, it's, it's nice to have somebody hold space for you and just be compassionate and be able to, to intuitively tune in and help you excavate some of that deeper stuff. That's a great word, excavate. Um, and thank you. You, you are um, giving away a little uh, a video instruction and worksheet to, for people to come up with their own scripts. I think this is a really valuable prize that they can win. And so if you're hearing this and you're hearing the word prize right now and you don't know what I'm talking about, um, all of our purchasers uh, are going to 
be entered in for giveaways and drawings and you can come into a special group on Facebook where all of our authors are and like there's so much goodness going on with this you guys um, so check those show notes um, and okay so if there was one more thing you wanted to say about your chapter in particular um, just to the reader who's moving through that or about tapping what would what would it be um, I would say two things. One is definitely watch the video on my resources page because tapping is experiential. So I want you to be patient with yourself and realize that not all tappers use the same points. So you can play with the different points. You can play with just saying the same statement over and over again, that there are no fixed rules on it. So be patient with yourself and just practice, just keep practicing. And I promise you, it will be rewarding and you will become proficient in it. And that um, just makes me think to say thank you to all of you who were willing to try to write your modality because everybody does experiential things with their clients and it's either one-on-one -on -one or it's on video or you share video resources. And that's why many of you have included resources in your chapter that people can just take it a step further, right? So thank you for taking that on. It's not easy all the time to write it in a book in words and get, and so that the reader really, you know, has the experience. But honestly, that was one of the other big goals I had that each chapter wasn't going to be just a teaser, but by the end of that chapter, you guys gave the person an experience that they could then feel something from. And it wasn't just like, oh, now I have to go somewhere else for it. You gave it to them in the chapter, which again, um, you guys are awesome. So let's move on to Karen and talk about breathing. Karen, tell us about your chapter. Oh, you got to unmute yourself, girl. <laughs> there you go. Please forget that one. When uh, you asked me, um, invited me into this book and writing a chapter, uh, I I was actually um, like just getting in the shower. And I know we went back and forth with a few ideas because Breathwork is just one thing, you know, one aspect of my work. And I came out of the, sh I was in the shower and was like, oh, breath, that's what I'll do. And I had no, re no idea like um, really why I, it really took me back to my, the foundation, back to my years of yoga teaching. And then, um, and then, you know, because I was so, um, into the breath while I was teaching yoga for 15 years that I learned so much. And then that really opened the doors and became the portal to everything, you know, that I do and that we all do as healers. Like, I don't know any healer um, that, or anyone who works one-on-one -on -one that doesn't say before they start a session, that doesn't say, take a deep breath, you know? And when someone is struggling or in a panic, we say, just breathe. And, you know, so, but what does that really mean? And so that's where I really got um, into writing this and these practice and pulling out my tools that I've really have relied on over all these years. I love that, uh, what you just said, because I, you know, reading through everybody's chapter, I don't think there is a chapter where it's not mentioned to breathe in this book, right? So breathing is foundational. I think it's also the very quickest access to your own body awareness that you could have. It's right there available to you any second. Um, I had, again, um, I've had a lot of wonderful healing experiences, but my experience with, um, and the, the woman I worked with called it transformational breath work was profound for me. And I, again, I'm a person who's dabbled a lot. So when you've done, you think you've done everything and then you get to something that, you know, takes you deeper at a level you weren't expecting. For me, it's, um, it can be scary a little bit, but it's, for me, it's really fun and amazing. And it allows me to have a conversation with people, you know, about possibilities, which is what this whole book is. So, um, breath work. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about how you're using it. And I mean, I, you know, we can use breath in yoga and in lots of other modalities, but how are you using it as its own? 
So, well, for me personally, um, you know, I, I really related um, to Jerice, what she said, and Laura, how emotion, the breath is, she didn't use breath, but as an access, you know, really accessing our emotions uh, coming into our body and our feelings. And so that's really um, been really powerful for me personally um, in the last few years. Uh, so it's that breath that it gets us deeper and under the layers, um, similar, you know, tapping and, you know, all the modalities, the, the breath is one of those that can get us into our heart, into our feelings, our sensations, gets us out of our head and into our bodies. That's really big. Yeah, and into, um, you know, how it's helped me uncover, you know, just my whole self. It's like when I was able to, from way back even, when I was able to, I talk about in my chapter how I was one of my breath pattern, and we all can have a different pattern of breathing that we've developed. Mine was reverse breathing. Um, and so, that really was cutting off my life force energy, which I discovered later. So when I learned how to come back home and over time uncover my, what I call my optimal breath, which is that breath that we're born with, when I could come back home to that, I uncovered my, you know, my true self, my wholeness. It's like when we can take a whole full breath what does that do for us? You know, when we're stuck in anxiety and stress, especially in these times, I feel like the world is holding their breath <laughs> right now. That's for sure. Um, when we can get into back to just that optimal, that deep, deep breath, that full breath, we uncover again. Well, what is truth? What is real in this moment? I love that. Thank you. Oh. Uh, you know, when you start to talk about breathing, even the conversation becomes profound, right? <laughs> because it is, a br breath is life. Um, thank you for tackling uh, that chapter. You know, everybody is tackling big, big um, ideas here in their chapters. And I appreciate you talking about the breath work. Um, okay, ladies, it is now time for our speed dating question portion of this show. And I'm going to go around and ask you a few questions and see, see if you can give me a brief answer. And don't laugh when I ask you the first one, because you're going to be like, I could talk about that for an hour. So let's stay with Karen for a moment. Karen, why holistic when it comes to healing? Wow. Um, holistic? <laughs> Yes, I know. I question. know. <laughs> uh, for me and my my work with clients and my the women in my circles, it's about wholeness. You know, uncovering what is our wholeness. It's tapping into our mind, our body, our spirit, our emotions, and our our whole entire being. So it's wholeness. Fantastic answer. How about you, Dries? How would you say, um, you know, why holistic healing in terms of just regular healing? Well, with the Enneagram in particular, um, it's all about integration, whole person integration. So we have three types of archetypes that arise out of the head, three that arise out of the heart, and then three that arise out of the belly. And, in, and we have all of this inside of ourselves. So as we become aware of what, how we're meeting our needs through our mind center and how we're meeting our needs and strategizing through our heart, and then what, and what is the body or belly wisdom also calling us to pay attention to? Right. So you can't leave one without the other. And ideally, uh, you know, with this giving our attention to our head, our heart, and our and the wisdom of our body, we will be able to restore being responsive and catch when we're being reactive, which usually begins with a fearful thought. Nice. Good answer. Thank you for that. You're making me think of um, one of the book reviews that we got from uh, Dr. Gobetti. 
and she she wrote about the book that people who haven't had success with traditional medical system are going to have some hope with this book. And I absolutely loved that piece of her review because, um, and that's how I think of holistic as an opportunity and a hope. And maybe you're going to learn something or something will um, help you that you didn't even know could help you if you, if you go at it holistically. So um, thanks for your explanation. So what do you think, Laura? Yeah, what I mean, else? on the heels of what you were saying too, I mean, I jumped into my healing journey because of medical issues and because I hit a certain wall with the medical community. I got so far, they helped me. But, you know, what I've learned is that we all have such a unique blueprint, you know, and every single one of us is different. Every snowflake is different. Every drop of water is different. We're all different. And so being able to really get to know and become familiar with all of those resources that you have within you at each layer and you know especially for those people i help a lot of people with chronic issues um, whether that's mental health related or physical that we really want to make sure we get to any long-standing patterns that have existed generationally or in past lives or in ancestral history and really starting to uncover the layers that are not necessarily consciously coming into your awareness yeah, and of course, our friend, uh, author friend Jacqueline Kane is actually hitting up that topic in chapter 24, I believe it is. Um, and how amazing that we have a book that is going to span all mind, body, and soul, you know, and each chapter itself is doing that. And then the whole book is doing that, you know, in these different ways, which is another thing that I absolutely love about it. Okay, so um, staying with you, Laura, for a minute, what's the best part about doing what you do about being a healer? The best part about being a healer is the fact that we can connect between practitioner and client, practitioner and clients, heart space to heart space, you know, and really feel like we are in this together. You know, and that while I am providing healing or offering that channel for healing, I am also receiving healing. So it's a win-win for everybody. You know, we're in this together. I get things from, you know, whatever might come from somebody else's Akashic Records or their intuition, you know, and that we all um, can form this collective space together and share in that compassion that we want for one another and for ourselves and that we're all kind of joining together on a journey. Okay, so you said it, so I'm going there. because. And you guys, if you're listening and you're going to become part of the special bonus group, um, what's going to go down there in the next three months is going to be absolutely spectacular because every expert author is going to have a chance to live stream teach about a topic. And um, I want you just quickly, Laura, to for the person who has never heard of the Akashic Records, what the heck is it? <laughs> The Akashic Records, they're like a spiritual library in the clouds. So it holds the book of everybody's soul and um, it's held safe and protected by guides, ascended masters, angels, loved ones who have passed. And when you open up your record, it's like they're taking the book of you off the shelf and it has all the information about you from when your full soul first incarnated and came into being until through future lives. So it's, it's like Google for the soul. You can ask any question you want. The book of you. There it is. Yeah. I love it. Um, all right, Karen, what's the, your very favorite part about being a healer? My favorite part is actually not the fact that like, I don't, call, I don't really like buy into for me, like I'm healing anybody. What I'm doing is giving them you tapping into their own ability to heal themselves. So our bodies are so wise and hold so much um, wisdom. And so it's, I get so turned on when a person, the, my client, the woman across from me or in the circle, she finds that within herself, that ability. Oh, you mean I, I uncovered this truth for myself. I, discovered this about my body. Um, so it's, that's what I love is when someone has that aha. I'm glad you talked about that because a lot of healers don't like the word healer. 
-hmm. which sounds funny, right? Because they know that um, all they're really doing is facilitating a process for the other person, you know, to hop on this journey and find all the magic themselves. Yeah. Um, and they so space for it. Yes, exactly. And that's a hot topic too, a hot sentence holding space. Like, what does that mean? It's really good for people to understand um, what that is. Because when you find someone who can really do it well for you, then it's magic, right? We use the word magic a lot too in this little <laughs> journey of ours. Um, Jerice, what's your favorite part about being a healer? Well, I'm going to ride the coattails of everything that's just been spoken here. And I like to really call myself a facilitator and guide. And part of what is so um, fulfilling for me is that I notice I get the privilege to join someone for this snippet in time, to be with them. And uh, in a way, go in the trenches with them inside of themselves and sit and ask the questions that call forth their inner wisdom. So I love that we're, you know, we're calling this book the self-healing techniques because I'm not doing the healing. I might be asking the questions. I might be being that clear mirror. And I feel like in those moments, um, I'm being guided to be able to be that. And that's deeply fulfilling for me. But then hearing sometimes months, years down the road, watching my clients connecting the dots themselves and having powerful relationships in their lives where they may have been all wadded up in a lot of anger. And maybe at that time, there might have been a lot of reason to have been, but they healed it. Um, so it's a little bit of all of that. So being able to be that mirror is the one of the most fulfilling things for me. I love it. Thank Add you. Something. Do you yeah, mind? Please. Is, yeah. I think that being a therapist and then going on this healing journey myself, um, the, the reason that I've integrated the healing into the therapeutic work is because of that empowerment, because it's so much more empowering for the client to be able to, they're not just taking tools that I've given them and practicing them, you know, and therapy is productive, you know, but it's only one layer. And, you know, I've really found that for that sustainable change, for that long-term change, you're really looking for them being able to access those resources within themselves and have that aha moment of, oh my gosh, this is accessible all the time to me. And they feel so resourceful and empowered. And that's, that's the, that extra layer that healing offers. And I think that we're all describing a feeling that is um, this feeling of, of fulfillment and gratitude and purpose when we're empowering somebody else, right? And I think if people are not being empowered in their healing process, something's wrong. Um, and I, one thing, other thing I know, and maybe each of you could talk about what you think about this, but I know that the best healers are master teachers. And so, Laura, what, what makes a great teacher in this world? I think what makes a great teacher is somebody who can have true empathy for the other person and understand the level of unique that they're coming from, under, really understand their context of where they've come from, and to be able to target. I think when it comes to teaching, you have to make sure that you really understand the other person's learning style and how they integrate and absorb and internalize information and be able to tweak. And that's the other piece about the healing world too. I mean, there's so many modalities from sound healing to, you know, to visualization, to drawing, to, you know, that really tapping into the modality that um, is not only speaking their language, but helping them internalize this into their subconscious so that it's long-term. I love it. Um, Karen, what do you think makes a great teacher? So I mentioned earlier about holding space, and uh, I think a good teacher knows part of that of holding space is really being able to listen and to be able to, from that deep listening, then to be able to communicate effectively, but also really um, being open. Um, you know, I facilitate circles, so I'm not in that necessarily in that teacher role, but what I am is I'm in. I'm empowering, um, as Laura said, um, totally empowering the others in there 
to find their own answers, to find their own way, to um, uncover those insights and ahas for themselves. Um, so a good teacher, you know, can does that. Yeah. And I think the facilitator, so, you know, you teach by example. So what's the example of a, a facilitator? <laughs> it is the deep listening. It's the grounding and centering. It's the practice of body awareness while you're sitting there. It's all of those things, right? So you're just making me think a bit, a bit about that. Jerice, what do you think is another mark of a great teacher in, in terms of healing? Well, it's, it's somebody who is able to impart knowledge, impart tools that empower. Uh, you know, again, we're back, we're back to empowerment. So it's, and the, the other thing is, I just want, want to clarify, it's not better than less than, you know, there's, it's uh, at the level, it's an equal playing field. I, you know, it's the namaste. I see, I see the, the God, the spirit in you and you in me. So it's a true honoring. There's, um, yeah, there's, it's a, a, a deep respect that one is on the same level as the other. So like that. I love that. Um, I remember being in a myofascial release seminar in the very beginning of my career, and I was trying to get a hold on what these what I saw to be master teachers were doing in that ballroom full of 200 people. They were holding space. And I, was, I, I struggled in the beginning so badly with how do you do that? You know, and I, was, I kept having that question, tell me how to do that. <laughs> you know, can, can you teach me? And of course, teaching presence is almost impossible. You just have to keep doing it <laughs> and then, uh, you know, hope your energy kind of, you know, moves out toward the uh, people who are wanting to learn it. But um, I just, I don't know why you're making me think of that, those moments. And now I absolutely love that I could sit here and even think about teaching that to somebody else. Like what a journey, even just that one topic is for me, like going from that place of never thinking I could do it, you know, to this place of, hmm, I think I, I might be able to teach that, you know, or talk about it at least. Um, that's a pretty big deal. Okay. So we got one more uh, speed dating question for you. It's my favorite question of all time ever, favorite writing prompt of all time. Jerice, what do you love to do so much you lose track of time? And it can't be Enneagram. You got to pick something else. <laughs> Riding my bicycle. Okay, that's a good one. What do you love about that? Oh my gosh, it is the it is the breeze. It is feeling like I'm a bird flying. Um, I I must say I do enjoy listening to my podcast and learning while I do it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a little bit of my two wheeled sanctuary. Um, where I get to feel nature and yet um, enjoy uh, a sanctuary time. I love it. Thank you. How about you, Karen? What do you love to do so much you lose track of time? You know, I actually lose track of time when I'm in my sacred space in the morning, <laughs> um, engaged in my practices, my um, my. What, whatever it is, I'm usually in the flow, but you know, rituals and meditation and journaling this, since this pandemic, I've been throwing in some um, watercoloring or dance. So it's just that like first time in the morning. I am also a morning person when it comes to those ritual types of activities. It uh, feels like sacred time for me, especially for my writing. Um, how about you, Laura? I would have to agree with Karen. It's really, um, when I open the Akashic Records, I just get lost, <laughs> you know, and I'm just, I, I could literally just be in them all day long and play with different modalities while I'm in that space, particularly sound healing. I could, I could be swept away and listening to my singing bowls for hours. <laughs> I love that we have two people in the book covering the sound uh, topics. One, uh, Sharon is talking about toning, making your own sounds, and Ian is uh, more the sound healing music uh, frequency of the produced music. And I love that we have two people covering it because even that one, you know, somebody might hear, oh, sound healing, and you're thinking, 
uh, there's so many different ways to experience that, even that one topic. So um, those two chapters are definitely going to be eye-opening for people who have never dabbled, you know, with those topics. Um, okay, ladies. So, so Laura, let's stay with you for a second. What's one, one thing, one last message you want to um, say to the reader who's got this beautiful book in their hands? Uh, you know, this person who's curious and a seeker and is like just loving the, the whole title of it. What's one last thing you want to say to them? So uh, I, I love the definition. I love the idea of a seeker. Um, but I also know, because being a seeker myself, that I love gathering information and learning, learning, learning as much as I can. So what I would, what I would caution you is don't try to do everything at once. You know, pick one modality and really stick with it and practice it. And then give yourself a little time to integrate it and see what kinds of shifts and changes are going on before you really dive in and commit to another, and I'm, I'm not talking about reading, I'm talking about practice, you know? Um, because especially when you're doing any kind of energetic work, it's definitely making shifts and changes at a deeper level that you're not necessarily consciously aware of. And you want to, you don't wanna break the human, you know, you wanna like give your body and your mind a chance to digest and really integrate all of this and have it settle, and then you can try your next one. Really beautiful advice. I think that's what makes this book such an incredible resource because if anybody just takes one chapter and really dives in, it could last them a while. <laughs> and then if they feel like they've exhausted that one, which almost is impossible with any modality, we all know that but then they can move on, right, and have another one, and they have 25 of them, which I just, I mean, still, I pinch myself um, with the understanding of just how much amazing brilliance is in this one book. Um, that's really, really great advice. Um, you're making me think of one other thing I, I don't want to forget to say. We we're having this conversation about resistance coming up, right? So you try something, you've never tried before, never maybe even heard of before, and you're not feeling so good. Your, your resistance is coming up. You're either feeling worse mentally, emotionally, physically, you know, whatever it is. And um, I had that experience doing a sound healing event online, of course, because we're all online right now. You know, normally it would have been in an in-person room with everybody. And so I was giving this a shot and a couple of people uh, had the experience, but had a lot of resistance, you know? So what do I mean by that? Well, they didn't like it. They couldn't jive with the sounds. They were expecting, um, more melodic music, normal music. Right. And so they were saying, they were giving me all this feedback, which was really great. And so as a, as a healer type person, facilitator of the process, I was finding myself trying to say something like, well, it's the resistance that is the greatest possibility here. <laughs> you know, like we try to get this idea over to people that what's in their face in terms of resistance is a huge opportunity for healing, right? And some people are going to be able to receive that and other people won't. And that's totally cool. But um, you were just making re me remember that moment. I think it's really good to have that conversation over and over with people. What yeah. are you feeling? You know? Yeah. And I say too, if you're going to pick a modality, 21 days minimum, you know, yeah, that's good. One days. Cause that's, yeah. that's the amount of time it takes to create a new habit and to integrate a new habit. And so during that 21 days, be patient with yourself, you know, kind of be patient with the resistance, hold it with compassion when it comes up, don't judge yourself, you know, right. and then, yeah, give yourself that 21 days and then trust that it will become more automatic. Well, and the most beautiful thing about our project is that every author is then accessible if you need to ask questions. And so, and also for sessions and for taking the work deeper and, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to go on and on about this. So um, you don't have to sit there stuck. You can connect with the author, ask your questions, figure out the next step go deeper, I highly encourage it. It's why chapter 25 is about hiring a guide, you guys. Um, so yeah, so, okay, so uh, Karen, what's one last thing you wanted to say to the reader of this amazing book? 
So kind of um, tapping on what you both said and um, is to just, you know, pick, let yourself be guided to, you know, a couple of those modalities in the book and just spend time with them. I love the 21 days too. And especially take advantage of the resources that we all have. Um, I know I have videos up. I know um, a lot of us have recordings up. So take it, read through, read it, the chapter through, sit with it, go to the resource page, take advantage of everything there. Yeah, good. Thank you. I hope that people do that. And if they do that, they're also going to find out that you could, you could talk about one modality, breath work, for instance, and 10 teachers teaching breath work will all teach slightly differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I also say it's that beginner's mind idea. When you look at this book and you uh, look at a chapter title like yoga and you think to yourself, ah, oh, I've been there, done that already. I'm going to skip that chapter. What I also encourage is not skipping, <laughs> is like reading the message of the author who is approaching that modality in their own unique way, right? And you're always, always going to learn um, a little nugget, something new, something different, even though if you think you've been there and done that. Um, Dries, what's the last thing you want to say to your reader? I'm going to go back to those powerful C words and just like you're pointing to right now to, to approach the book with great curiosity and the, uh, the self healing piece is really, really key. And, and there is something revolutionary about this book. It's, it is a gigantic menu of lots of different options that's going to give you a powerful relation, a new relationship to yourself a new relationship to your inner guidance. And then the paradox is also when you hit those places of resistance, you know, to pay attention to where it's like, ah, okay, I could really use a loving guide here with me right now uh, to go deeper, to um, allow for the humility of that part of the journey to let someone join you to support you so that something else can become possible. Mm, I love it. One of my favorite questions ever of the whole universe is what else is possible in terms of my healing? Um, ladies, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, this energy again is palpable and um, you all are badass. So thank you for being a part of it. Um, and everybody who's listening, um, one last thought for you. Um, so before that last thought, let me just uh, remember to say, you guys just pop over to the show notes. You have websites of the authors there. You have notes about how to get a hold of the book. And you also have some links for the amazing bonuses Facebook group giveaways again on and on I could go um, so don't forget to go do that and explore a little bit and then lastly today I just want you to remember you were born so you are worthy your message matters what if the thing you're still a little afraid to share is exactly what someone needs to hear to change or even save their life it is time to be brave <laughs>